near mint condition, the home of collected oh, edition. That cover is so awesome. Absolute format is the best way to own this store. Time to empty those wallets and fill those shelves. How's it going, all you mentees? Uncanny Omar here from Near Mint Condition, the home of collected editions. And join me today for my overview of these latest fanographic books that have come out. So, let's go ahead and get started. And welcome back, everybody. Before going any further, a big thank you to the folks at Fanographics for sending us copies of these latest releases. So we have a couple of hard covers in a really unique soft cover, but this book is so interesting and so amazing that they even found. I, I do want to talk about all of them, of course, but this one here could be one of the greatest comic book finds in the 21st century. It's just that amazing. Uh, but we are going to be talking about Hypericum first, uh, and then talking about this Frank Johnson book, and then the Mickey and Donald Fantastic Futures. Just in case you're wondering, and if i um, probably not going to put any timestamps because there's only three, but that's the order I'm going to talk about them in. So yeah, let's kick it off with Hypericum. So the book is a hardcover. Here's what the spine looks like. And then the back of the book, there is no dust jacket. It's just art on board, and it does have a flat spine. We'll look at the binding here in a little bit. Here is your orange end sheets and the title page right there, Hypericum. And this is all done by Manuel Fior, who did a couple of other fanographic books. But this one here was so interesting in the way that it's done. It has 144 pages and retails for $29.99. And the way the story is done, it, it, it's like a parallel story. It follows the story of finding uh, King Tut's tomb for the first time through journal entries right here. So it starts off on the 27th of October of 1922 and where they're heading to in Cairo and the exploration and exactly what they're looking for. Now, before I go any further, I will say that this one does have mature themes and a lot of it has to do with uh, sexual content. So just in case, I know that some of my viewers can't read stuff like that, but just look at this amazing artwork. I, when I read Manuel's other works, I always thought that there was some anime or manga influence and maybe, maybe there is. So that's part of the story. Again, finding King Tut's tomb. So looking for the treasure really of Tutankhamun. And then we fast forward some years, like right, I want to say in the 90s at first you're not it's kind of vague where it starts off definitely before 2001 uh and before cell phones became a huge thing so i want to say about 90s because they do talk about the berlin wall and things like that so this particular part of the story focuses on Teresa, and she's awarded a scholarship to work on tutankhamun's exhibition in berlin she doesn't really f understand the language or speak the language but it's about her just adapting to this life and world. And it's just pretty mundane at first. You know, a, a, a young lady that doesn't have any money. She's in a new country. And everything gets crazy when she meets this young man. And this guy right here. Ruben. Who's about to turn her world upside down. Oh, I don't want to say much more about it because I want people to experience it. Uh, because it's like when they meet, I guess this is what they call a meet cue, right? Is that what, what it is? Um, she ends up just following this guy that's like, hey, you want to go get some lunch or you want to go uh, and catch a train. And you're wondering, like, why the hell is she following this guy? But you see a connection immediately. And it does go back to this. Like, the parallels are there. Uh, she's a little bit of an insomniac and. It seems like as you're reading this, she's kind of always gotten what she's wanted in life. And this is her first time she's ever had any kind of detour. And it's all symbolized by this guy named Ruben. 
and it becomes a chaotic world for her. And it alternates again between her experience in Berlin and, and what is what I think, like I said, maybe the 90s. Yeah, I think it's late 90s, maybe mid 90s as she is ending up discovering herself and what she really wants out of life. Like, is this really where she wants to be? Is this really what she wants to do? So I, I love it because it uh, reminded me of my time when I was that age. And I really didn't know what to do. Hell, I'm 46 now and I still don't know if exactly what I want. I love doing this, by the way. There was a time, and I think all of us experienced it when we're young, and trying to find our way in life and letting the universe or whatever force guide us. And then something gets thrown in there and we're thrown for a curveball. So that's what it reminds me of. And it's absolutely stunning and beautiful artwork. And I said that it's got manga flair and anime flair. Uh, because when you go to Ruben's apartment, there's an Akira poster. There's like a Gundam poster. And you're like, oh, this guy's a big otaku. But I can't show those because of... Uh, said sexual content so you can find out for yourself and yes the more and more you keep going back and forth the more you see the similarities in the two worlds that are at first you're like oh, what is going on so that is all i will say about that all the way in the back there is just all these thank yous back here and no extras no sketches or anything now as far as the binding it is sewn binding, and it has 144 pages printed in this thick, glossy paper. And that is Hypericum. Frank Johnson, Secret Pioneer of American Comics, Volume 1. So this title contains Wally's Gang, the early years, 1928 and 1949, and the Bowser Boys, 1946 to 1950. There's Fanagraphics logo and the secret pioneer of american comics and it is printed to look like this old notebook right here like a weather notebook uh this one is a soft cover and it does have glued binding now what did i mean when i said that this is probably the greatest comic book discovery of the 21st century well hear me out frank johnson was a musician and he was a shipping clerk and then in 1979, he passed away suddenly and left behind this insane amount of notebook pages of comic books. So there's like 2,300 notebook pages of comics. Uh, there was 131 unbound drawings, a massive continuous storyline beginning with the earliest, and I hate to say this part, surviving notebook that was dated 1928, when he was 16 years old. So you have a forward here, an introduction, the Bowser Boys, the Wally's gang stories that are broken down by different books, and then about. Because this is insane to think about. Like, okay, sure, there's a small chance, which I seriously doubt, just because of the research and the amount of uh, time spent making this book, that this could be fake. But... Oh, this kind of reminds me of the documentary I saw the in the realms of the Unreal, which is all about Henry Darger, uh, who was this janitor in Chicago who left behind, oh my gosh, 15,000 pages of images about the Vivian girls and it's his storyline that I don't know if he got tried to get published or not, but I just find these people really interesting that somebody would take this amount of time to draw for themselves. Now, if you think of the date 1928, and if this is truly when he started, and we'll get to it here. So here we have introducing the Bowser boys. He is doing sequential artwork. Of course, he's doing two panel on notebook paper. And I'm surprised notebook paper survived that long. But there were other volumes before this one. What this predates is comic books. What this predates is the comics that came out in the 30s. And that's just crazy to think about, that this gentleman was probably a pioneer of the comic craft, and nobody knew about it. Not his wife, not his kids. I think it was his stepkids. Like, there's wonderful introductions here, by the way. Uh, there's a forward right here. Uh, this is by Chris Byrne. And there is an introduction. Talking about the history of how they found these particular pieces of art. This is by Keith Mayerson and how it's now in New York. 
at Columbia University. And it's, you know, in good hands and getting the proper scans so we don't lose things like this. So this right here could be, or I guess could have been the template for comic books as we know it, which is just insane. Now, I haven't read the whole thing. I've read some of it. And honestly, you know, okay, so you have a couple of things in here. You have the stories here of the Bowser boys who are just these homeless dudes that are drunks because Johnson himself was an alcoholic and then there, he was a recovering alcoholic so there's about a nine year span sometimes in between notebooks and what's really interesting is seeing the progression going from two panel grids to four panel grids and the scans are done as best as possible but sometimes depending on the different types of inks that he was using keep in mind when this started right here at least with this comic he was 16 years old so you get a little bit into the 40s and the 50s they'll tell you the dates down here it's an amazing journey to see something like this come out and that's all the bowser boys right here collected and then we get to wally's gang and this is the one that i was talking about wally's gang is had some before this particular notebook was found so this is book 91 so there are 90 books before this just lost that they couldn't find or unless they're trying to find them and trying to restore them as far as the introduction though this is all they know about and it's just really interesting to see some of the pencil drawings and going to inks and then just trying different types of uh, methods and then of course expanding on that like I mentioned two panel grid this is freaking amazing and some of the art is pretty solid the the later on he goes um what I was saying is that it was his stepson that found these and nobody knew about these characters and this chronological order of stories that he was telling just himself until he passed away. He had been doing it for 50 years. This is a lifelong project. And it's interesting to see him, without him even knowing, invent a lot of the comic tropes that we know nowadays. Or the way that people use this medium to tell stories. It's an amazing secret part of history. And in the beginning, in the intro, you also find out the Bowser Boys could have been your first like underground comic without him even knowing he created an underground comic. And I think about all the different, by the way, they do scan the notebooks too. I think about all the different people out there that have stuff like this that they found over the years. Like somebody's grandfather's art, pieces of art that could have been comic books. Uh, maybe in a way this was therapeutic for him, right? I mean, if he was an alcoholic. Um, the introduction goes a little deeper into that. Looking at the idea that perhaps he needed some kind of outlet uh, instead of becoming or, or giving in to alcohol. Or maybe this was his way when he was drinking to just take it out. It, it's really interesting uh, to think about that. Because I, I jokingly always have said in my channel that, hey, at least I got into comics and not heroin. Because I probably would be dead by now. And there might be some truth behind that. You know, we have this... I don't want to call it OCD, but we do have something as collectors in us that just keeps us moving to collect the next thing, whether we're excited to read it or whether we're just excited to have it in our collection. I think there's a little bit of that to us, a, a little bit of obsession. And there's good obsession and bad obsession. Uh, but anyway, I'm not here to talk about that. I just wanted you to check this out. And I wonder how many more pieces of comic book history like this will turn up here in the next few years where people are like oh my gosh this got published that's awesome my grandfather did something similar when he was out in fighting in the war or even like me they came from overseas there's so many comic strips i grew up with from the local newspapers like that stuff has never been collected and i keep an eye on it because i have family that live in peru and it would be just I mean, there is an insane amount of stuff like this that could turn up, and it just, this is such an amazing find.
Um, the book retails for $49.99, and it does have 634 pages. There are bios all the way in the back about the people, who they are, and what their particular job was during this restoration process. So this is book one, and if there's 2,300 pages, and this one has 634, you know, we've got a few more volumes coming. This right here does feel like that notebook. I mean, it's not, it's not part of the board itself. This does feel like it's attached on there, like a part of a notebook that you would find. So this was amazing. Like, I can't believe we have something like this now in 20... This came out earlier this year in 2024. But if you haven't heard about it, and if you're interested at all in the history of comics, you might be wanting to check this out. Last but not least is Walt Disney's Mickey Mouse and Donald Duck's Fantastic Futures. This is the classic tales with a 20 second century twist that's right we're talking about 100 years in the future once upon a mouse in the future uh the book is a hardcover and no dust jacket and sewn binding printed in this really thick glossy paper so this one is really interesting uh because it's not just donald and mickey it also features goofy you have daisy in there minnie and pluto and mortimer uh, but this is really interesting because what they do, here's the table of contents, by the way, telling you where you're going to find each of these stories, who worked on these particular stories. What they do is they take a classic cartoon, Lonesome Ghost, for example, and they reimagine it in the future, 100 years in the future. Now, it doesn't have to be specific 100 years in the future, but I think that's what most of these are. And this is really interesting because over here on the left-hand side, before the main story, they tell you a little bit about the behind the scenes of said cartoon. Like, Lonesome Ghost was released on December 24th, 1937. That's a few weeks away from Disney's birthday, because I think his birthday was December 5th. Uh, but also, just three days after the premiere of Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. So they talk about a lot of the animation skills that they used here, like some of the new things they were trying out, because they were trying to up the game of animation. And then, of course, the plot of the story. So if you, in case you've never seen it and you're reading this, you could be like, oh, that is very similar. So there are a group of ghost-busting characters in here, but again, taking place in the future where Pete is fooling them into thinking that he's a ghost, but in actuality, there could be ghosts here. So if you've seen the original cartoons, these mean so much more to you. I, that's what I loved about this because every one of these cartoons I remember... This one here, I thought Pluto was in it, but he's not in the Martian rover, Mickey's Martian rover. So this is Mickey's trailer, the classic cartoon from 1938, where they go across country, and what was it? I think it was Goofy driving, and the trailer gets away from him. So instead, it takes place on Mars, where they're going on vacation. Goofy does get the drive, uh, but they introduce a couple of new characters, like robots and stuff, and the art is a lot different. Clock cleaners... This one is, again, set 100 years in the future. And over here, they do tell you who the artist is of the cover and who the artist is But then, of the main story. But then again, you could just go back here to find out who drew it and who wrote it. All these written by Francesco Artibani. So, like, this is the... Instead of a giant clock, it's a giant robot that they are hired to clean. Again, modernizing it, but modernizing it for something that's happening in the 22nd century. Chip and Dale make a appearance here, and this one is based on Trailer Horn, but it's called Exoplanet Trailer, where Donald just wants to escape and be alone with nature, but instead he goes to a different planet. They even have the hijinks of the diving board in here, where Chip and Dale remove the diving board as he's about to jump in there, but they modernize it. This is the Fire Brigade, where Mickey, Donald, and Goofy are putting out the fire but making it even worse and you have Clarabelle that shows up through here and even in the future book or in the future comic Clarabelle does show up through there boat builders become starship builders I'm thinking you probably get the idea and a lot of this of course is European art translated for the first time here in English this is the one that features Pluto and some of this art I just absolutely love you know I'm more of a duck guy 
but I've been getting some of the Mickey stuff or like modern day Mickey comics. This is one of my favorites. You know, people are tired of the multiverse. I don't care. I like alternate realities and possible futures. I still get a kick out of them. And I understand that, you know, after a freaking movie wins an Oscar and it's a multiverse movie, sure, people will probably get burned out. I don't. Um, because I like the idea. The, uh, I've always liked the concept of traveling to different times and dimensions. Uh, but this one, you'll see a lot of different cartoons from Mickey's past that he's able to jump through to go into their universe. Your end sheets right here. And let's look at The Binding. So it is sewn binding. The book has 256 pages and retails for $34.99. It is printed in this thick, glossy paper stock. So there's really very minimal bleed through. And that is Mickey and Donald Fantastic Futures. That, as they say, is that. If you're interested in purchasing any of these books, don't forget to check out our sponsors. If you're in Europe and you're interested in buying these books, definitely check out Walt's Comic Shop in Berlin, Germany. They have the cheapest pre-order prices, flat shipping rate of 12 euros for all EU countries, emails answered within 24 hours, waltzcomicshop.com, and you can use the code near mint condition at checkout and get free shipping for all EU countries with your first order over 40 euros. That's Walt's Comic Shop, your reliable source for omnis and premium collected editions in Europe. Ding! CheapGraphicNovels.com, your online home for graphic novels and collected editions up to 50% off cover price. They have excellent shipping and prompt and helpful service. Check out their bargain deals for up to 90% off cover price. And don't forget that CGN also takes pre-orders. That way you don't miss out on the hottest releases. And they are currently running a special promotion for you Minties. If you're a first time customer, after receiving your order confirmation email, reply back to that email and let them know Near Mint Condition sent you their way. They will then apply a free shipping promotional credit to your next order in the US. Cheap Graphic Novels, your source for the hottest books with a kind of deep discount, quality shipping, and customer service that will keep you coming back for more. And that was the content, the page count, and build of these books. Let me know in the comments down below which ones you plan on picking up, which ones you've already read, which series you already collect, or which creators you go for, or if you've ever heard of this Frank Johnson book. If you have any questions, leave them down below. Don't forget to smash that like button, subscribe, and ring that bell for notifications. Everyone, stay healthy and safe out there. Much love.